rained a bit today. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of was just uh, doing all kinds of errands and stuff. Um, so yeah, I had a, kind of a bit. I'm trying to ride tomorrow though. Some couple dudes from France in Philly that I, a couple dudes I know. Um, so gonna try and meet up with them tomorrow. Sick. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. There we go. Well, I think yeah. it's me. My screen time's three. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it it gets a little hairy. Yeah. How have you been? I'm doing pretty good, man. Uh, I actually went pedaling today. Um. For the first time in a little bit, right. I've been Where dealing. Are you now? Albany, New yes. York. <clears throat> it's uh, it's got some stuff for sure. Yeah. All right, let me just add me in here real quick. Yeah. Right. Yeah, look at that. It's starting to look like right. something. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring, like. Like I started realizing when I was like doing thumbnails, I'm like both people's heads got to be the same size. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> you know, yeah. so you don't want one person to kind of look like a giant. That's kind of fucked up. Yeah, there we go. Something like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Right, that looks like normal. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, we got in here now. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. Ah, it's all good. You got the poster. <laughs> What's that? So you got the Wiz poster. Yeah, so I just found that recently. Like I've I've hung that up every place I've ever lived. And when we got the house, everything just kind of got packed away, and I didn't I didn't uh, pull anything out. And then the one day I was like, yeah. I remembered it, and I'm like, fuck, I gotta go get it. And so it's it's being hung up by like stickers because I've torn and tattered the corner so much yeah so it's a little it's a little shitty still but uh uh yeah, there's a there's a, a five-story building there now are you serious yeah <laughs> holy shit and yeah that whole that was like this huge lot it was like almost like a block long that was empty mm-hmm. and um yeah it's the build there's a new building there it's not done yet but it's like in the process of being built so uh, uh, while we're talking about it, can can I pick your brain about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, I've been there. I've, I've been past it a couple times. It's yeah. like, but um, he oh, really American Street. He really got that fucking high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Wiz, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's his his deal, man. He, he can somehow go like two feet higher than everyone else on the like quirkiest, yeah, weirdest transitions. Yeah, always, man. Always been doing that. Even like. There's a photo Bob shot of him on the uh, Afro Banks in like 2000, mm-hmm. 2001. And it was like in his ride interview, and um, I believe. And yeah, even today, like how high it was then is like to someone to do that today is still like crazy. Yeah, that's that's the reason I've hung that up everywhere I've been is because it's literally my favorite photo because it's like it's so fu- he's so high like. It doesn't even make sense to me still. Like I've been riding plenty of time and still it's still just crazy to me. Yeah. He he's been a big inspiration. Uh I hate to sound like a huge fanboy, but I mean <laughs> Nah, Wiz is the man. He's like fucking such an influential rider too. It's like it's crazy. Like Yeah, he in, he invented he, What's up? Yeah, just the amount of stuff that he's invented. Like it's kind of crazy. Years. Like yeah. he kind of laid the bedrock for a lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah. But um yeah, I, I watched that video you sent me, uh, the intense energy. All right. Which yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounded familiar, and, and then so I, I watched your part, and then right after it, Joe's part, Joe Tizio's part came up, and I'm like, that's why it yeah. sounded so familiar. But, dude, you were steezy like, like I I can't find a clip of you like looking like a beginner and shaky. Like everything you've ever done is like you look like a seasoned vet. Like it's kind of crazy. I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> you looking sketchy. <laughs> oh, the you jumped the incline club boxes backwards while transferring from landing to lip, I believe. Yeah. That like I've been to incline club like back in the day. Like I it, on my on a really good day, maybe I clear one box and that, you know, I was trying really hard. <laughs> So when I saw that shit, I'm like, 
man's they, always they also been smooth. made the boxes a lot bigger too like mm. that was when it first opened right right like, Incline Club opened 2001, so it was like j- literally just opened when that footage was filmed. Gotcha. Um, but then I think a few years later they made all boxes like bigger and they yeah. were just so. I don't know when you went there, but it might not have been that setup. Too, yeah, so. I don't think it was. I think I I definitely caught it, caught wind of it a couple a couple renovations after that. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so those were like they were like five foot box, five foot tall. The two. Were probably like five foot tall, and then the other two were like four foot or something. They were like they were all pretty small. They weren't like they the ones the, the new the new next round that they built after that were like all definitely a lot bigger. Yeah. So. Scotty needed some room to do some shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Hell yeah. Um, well, I we were talking about the rollback pod with with Kyle, <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that stuck out to me when I was listening to it was he was talking about your just overall outlook and like always being down for adventure and i was kind of curious where that came from um i mean i don't know it just kind of ever since i was a kid as soon as i got a bike and i could like go pedal places i just wanted to go explore yeah and it just went from there that's always been something that i enjoy doing is seeing what's around the corner i guess you know Right, and and did your parents take you anywhere going to go ride or anything like that? Or? Nah, I was kind of always just on my own. Like I had to buy my own bike parts and mm-hmm. bikes, whatever. It was just it was all funded by my paper out <laughs> until I could get a real job. Wow. Um, what what so, was your first job? Uh, I worked at this fast food restaurant. Just yeah. Being like a busboy and just you know typical high school job. Yeah. But damn. Um, but I was able to make some money and buy parts, so I was happy. Yeah. So do you kind of keep your personal like obligations at, to a level where like it's easy, it's easier for you to say yes to stuff? Like you try and keep, keep all of your uh, things in, in a way where it's easy for you to like pick up and go, go on a trip. Like you don't have to. Like, yeah. I, I try to keep stuff as flexible as possible. Obviously that's the older you get, the harder that yeah. becomes. <laughs> but, right. But uh, I've been fortunately able to like keep that level of flexibility pretty pretty uh open yeah for up to this point so yeah like i don't, I don't know if you have any pets but i doubt you have three cats you know what i mean you have two actually two but yeah but not nice. late Paul she she uh holds it down when i'm gone oh so. cool so you have somebody to, somebody to help you know look over stuff and... yeah yeah awesome could i get like a reprint of that poster somehow uh, not the actual poster, but no. the the photo, yeah, sure. Damn, that would be sick. Did yeah. you? And it was shot medium format. It, it was square. Yeah, 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 it was like six by six film. Holy that shit! That was like my the era. That was shot in the era where that was like my primary f- photographic tool. Mm. So you stayed you stayed with the medium format like that exclusively for a period of time. I mean, it wasn't it was never exclusive where that's the only thing I shot, uh-huh. but it was like my main go-to for like most scenarios right wow probably because it was just my favorite camera so still is but Mm -hmm. um yeah that's just yeah the especially for that time period like the quality of the image Mm -hmm. um just and so many love and just the the different film stocks you can use it just it just created these one-of-a-kind photos the optics of the the uh lenses Mm -hmm. also just like Still to this day, it's like you can't really get the same exact look with mm-hmm. 35 millimeter lenses that you can with like a medium format camera like that. And what's I know it's like a medium format camera is like it usually shoots a square, a more square photo typically. Yeah, it depends on the camera brand. Like the one I use, Hasselblad, so that's like the most of the the, the film backs that you can buy for those that mm-hmm. camera body or or six by six. But mm-hmm. they also made like six by four five, which is rectangular. Right. Um, and most of the other medium format brands at the time were either like six by four five, and there was a couple I think of six by six also. But the Hasselblad one was like the became well known for that square format. Mm-hmm. And the the term medium format is that does that have to do with that? ratio or is it more to it than that it's a, it's the size of the film basically. right right so yeah it's a bigger it's a bigger uh piece of film yeah it's yeah. like like uh, i don't know the exact ratio but it's like 
or comparison, but it's probably like twice the size of a little more than twice the size of a, a 35 right. millimeter. Wow. Negative for slide. Damn. So when you were first getting into shooting and getting photos in magazines and stuff, how were you submitting the photos to the magazines? Were you sending them the negatives or? Yeah. I mean, when I first started trying like contributing to magazines, it was still before digital cameras were commonplace. Yeah. So everyone just shot film. So I would just pack up my slides or negatives mm -hmm. and mail them off to various magazines. Damn. So if that, if that negative gets lost, Say that, you, I mean, and th this is before scanners had kind of went down, like good scanners went down in price. So I never scan anything. Mm. I would send the film. And yeah, if it got lost, then that's it. Wow. Did you <laughs> ever lose anything that. like that? What, what's that? Did you ever end up losing anything like that? Um, I never had anything lost in the mail, mm -hmm. but I've had issues trying to get photos back from, say, companies or or I mean, I can't say right. any specific magazines had lost any of my photos, but I know comp like I had sent film photos to companies and those just disappeared. Some of my favorite ones too, which I'm kind of, I was partly my fault too. I wasn't really at that time period. I didn't see, I valued my photos, but I wasn't, I was more like survival mode where I was like, Hey, if I get paid for this cool, then I didn't really think about getting the film back right away. And then it was like, you know, a number of years later, I'm like contacting, trying to contact different people at a couple of key companies. And either it was like new people that were working there and they didn't know where anything was or hmm. things just lost. So, damn. Yeah. Which is kind of bummer. But for the most part, I'd say like 99% of my photos I, I have. Right. Or I yeah. have access to getting back. Nice. And yeah. do you keep, uh, do you keep uh, the printed versions as well? Like when they come out in magazines, do you have like a, a yeah, whole Yeah, like, I pretty library? much have a copy of everything that I've gotten. Oh, printed. that's so cool. Somewhere along the way. Nice. Yeah. Fuck Just me. kind of a keepsake for myself. You know? Yeah. And yeah. you've like photographed pretty much everybody. Like. Uh, I don't know about everybody. <laughs> over the years, you, you, you just cross paths with so many different yeah. people. It's like at some point, yeah, you get to, uh, especially when during an era where there was like, you know, you're going to going on big road trips, like, like road fools or something. And you're just meeting all different people. You're going on other random trips. Mm -hmm. You're going to like events or something. Like you end up crossing paths with so many different people and get to get to know people or whatever. And like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be around this town, meet up with you, whatever. And you know, just, that's how things, you know, you end up. Yeah. You know, and at, after a certain point, yeah, you end up shooting photos with a lot of people. Yeah, I, I tried to try to do some research on you on the twenty three mag website. Yeah, yeah, that's and, a a great resource for myself whenever I'm like trying to <laughs> nail down dates and, <laughs> and yeah. I don't want to like go thump like look around for three different magazines. I could just go right there. It's like it's a yeah yeah. I'm a big fan of that site. But just you for, you were so. hard to look up because so you have photo credit on so many photos that like. Oh. <laughs> To find specific content just about you is a little bit more seldom, a little bit more, more rare. Um, you never, uh, I, I, I saw like maybe video credits for like helping film certain things, but it seems like you really leaned into the photography. Was there ever like a point where like you thought about getting into more? Like obviously you just released this new video part, yeah. you, know, you know, so it's like uh, you're into it to some degree, you know, mm -hmm. getting clips and filming. Uh, was there like, um, did you ever like try and push for more like your, I'm fucking up my words. Basically <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out like, I'm probably, I'm probably forgetting stuff like off the top of my head of that you might've been involved, involved in or filmed, but mm -hmm. did you make any videos yourself before this recent solo edit? I mean of myself or like actual like video production like not include not necessarily about myself like, or like of myself I'll, i'm i'm open to hearing about both because I, well, I mean i'm so negligent i need to know <laughs> i mean take me to school rob first time i really like did something in the media realm was like i made a little video of like my friends when i was like just after high school you know like that was and that was a video i was the first that was before i ever owned a, a still camera 
Right. Okay. Wow. So that's really cool. You shot, you made video parts before you even shot a photo. Uh, it was like a full video, but it was just like, it wasn't really like a video part. It was more just like, like I said, clips of me and my friends riding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. It was VHS, you know, like one of those like shoulder mount VHS cameras. Like, just, wow. Yeah. Um, and then a few years after that, that's when I got my first, um, still camera, which was just for like a zine that I started making. I needed photos for it. So I decided to get a camera. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from that point on, that's when I like pretty much was just, um, learning how to shoot photos. I didn't really do any kind of filming or anything at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in the early two thousands, like, like 2001 ish, I'd say, yeah, probably 2001, 2002. At that point I was shooting a lot of photos and there wasn't always a filmer around while I was shooting photos and there was like all this like great ride amazing riding going down mm -hmm. so that's when i decided to buy a video camera and i got like a trv 900 and just started filming stuff too at that point and there was like for a number of years up until hd came became the standard i was filming you know quite a pretty regularly doing some, like i did some prop segments and yeah and then once <clears throat> hd came into play i was like so immersed in just photography i just like didn't bother mm. trying to like evolve to hd cameras i was just like i'm good i'm just i just kind of stopped pretty much stopped filming at that point oh wow and, um around 2014 that's when i like started filming a bit again mm. and doing some projects now mainly now it's like dig, dig related project video projects right but it's like events or whatever yeah, I remember when when Ken I came out. It's like phew, there was so much going on. Like you were you were bound to to help film, right? It's oh yeah, yeah. There was just like yeah, there was just yeah. I said like between yeah. like Edwin and a few other dudes, it was just like they were wow. just doing so much good shit. And it it actually been it was filmed in like a pretty short amount of time. And it's like Bob Sherbo was like, you know, he's only one person. He can't be around everyone all the time. So mm -hmm. during that time period, that's when like, you know, I had my TRV. So someone was like, Hey, I'm going to try this, whatever. So I was just, you know, so I ended up just filming stuff and then it was just kind of mm -hmm. turned into, you know, I had a good chunk of the, of clips filmed that went toward, can I eat? Damn. So. That's wild. Uh, and, uh, when did the maintain, uh, project start? Uh, 2015, 2015. That was like, when I did the first like it was chapter one which was chapter one yeah yeah and that was mainly because the prior year was when the publisher dropped dig mm, right and basically they were like closed doors and shut down pretty much well, i think all their titles at that point um because they had like 14 titles or wow um yeah it was like this huge operation in in the U in london mm -hmm. and they just didn't really weren't really paying attention to the times and just kind of yeah right. kind of imploded so at that point, um, fortunately, Will was able to get, get the, the Dignate title back on, at, under his ownership. Wow. Because it was, you know, um, which was a bit of a process, I believe. Hmm. Um, he had, had to, you know, pay a good chunk of money for it to get it back. But he finally did, which was awesome. So, um, But then once he got that back and then he was just working on, there was like a gap between the last regular published issue yeah and then when the next one was 99 well, that was the last published issue was 99 and then they came out with they did came out with 99.5 but that wasn't until i think the end of 2015 mm -hmm. so there was like a over a year and a half gap and in that time i was still shooting photos and didn't really you know once dig ended it was kind of like print there wasn't really any outlet print wise Mm -hmm. so that's when i was I came decided to start doing something on my own and that's when that's how the maintain series came about wow and since since uh dig is is based in europe and you're from the east coast how did you get involved with dig versus uh any of the other magazines in america um well dig's kind of more like even though will smith he's he's from uk mm -hmm. and currently lives there it's always been more of like a worldwide thing like you yeah. know ryan tunney was like a big part of dig yeah when I mm -hmm. getting involved with dig um same with like sandy carson was living in the u.s you know there's a number of people that the majority of people almost 
I won't say the majority, but like a good chunk of the people that have always worked for Dig were from the U.S. anyway. So it's always like an international thing more than just like pigeonholed as like a U.K. magazine. Right. But sometimes it was related to that just because, you know, that's where it was where it started. Yeah. Um, but at the by the time I got involved with it, with like contributing, um, it was a right, you know, it was an international thing. It wasn't just once yeah. it was based somewhere. I It definitely. uh I remember seeing a, like a lot of Philly stuff in it when I, when I first started getting into magazines and like, so yeah. it didn't read to me in, immediately as being European mm-hmm. or um, from the UK, but yeah, it's definitely like it transcended those, those, um, you know, that area for sure. Like, yeah. And it was so well put together. It just seemed like this is, this is from somewhere else other than America. Cause it doesn't look like a BMX plus, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, Will's a pretty much a genius when it comes to layouts and, like, curating content. Like, yeah, it's just, he's always been incredible at it, so, and it still shows to this day. Yeah, shout out to him. Um, yeah. So, uh, we, I think we first met at 2x4, is that right? Okay. I'm guessing. I'm, I think we might have, if, if we didn't meet at 2x4, then it was probably at FDR when uh, Van had me. <laughs> he would pick me up in Delaware at the train station uh-huh. and bring me over <clears throat> to work at two by four. And some days he'd be like, uh, don't get on the train. Meet me at FDR, some shit like that. And I'm like, fuck yeah, sick. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, probably, I think I might've met you at two by four for the first time. Cause he had that was like, that was, um, probably before I lived in Philly. So I really wasn't going to FDR yet. Oh, I mean, I'll go to FDR like once a year or something, you know, once or twice a year max you right. know, before I moved, actually moved to Philly. Um, so hmm. I'm guessing, yeah, it's probably, probably two by four. Yeah. Cause he had the spine out the, the like, <clears throat> not like neon olive green spine. Yeah. I remember that thing. Yeah. And, and that was the first time I got to do graphics with, um, real legit photography mm-hmm. and, ever like even in school like in art school like i would never fuck with the photos because i always grew up with like that bmx mentality it's like i'm not gonna fuck with this photo it's got to stay exactly how the photographer took it like yeah you know i'm not gonna apply a filter to the photo i'm not gonna crop it i'm not i don't even want to put anything on top of it i don't want to put anything on top of the corner of the fucking photo like yeah and i did this thing where i took your portrait the portraits you took of the guys and then mm-hmm. the riding photo i like laced them on top and i'm like this looks so official like i'm like thinking that i'm doing some good ass design work i'm like no is this is good ass photography work like the work speaks for itself <laughs> yeah it's it's incredible and and i, I can't thank van enough for that opportunity because that was really awesome but um yeah i think that was the first time we met and um, just seeing each other here and there it was good to hear that you had that perspective of like how to lay things out because it is just funny because you, you know if you look at through magazines or whatever over the years you could always tell when someone who has really no idea about riding laid out an ad because mm. they would always do these like real goofy things to to like whether it's like a good photo or not they would just do yeah real goofy things to yeah to the uh, layout to make it in their eyes look look good. Mm-hmm. instead of like focusing just you know letting a photo speak for itself you know yeah you gotta you gotta tread lightly and then sometimes i'll see people that do like put stuff over the photo and i'm like wow that was actually really tasteful like i mean let me let me take a feather out of that guy's hat and yeah. <laughs> put that in my brain bank for later you know it's crazy have you ever had anybody or not any have you ever had any like goof ups with that kind of stuff with your photography? Has anybody like Yeah, I mean it, it's happened, but mm-hmm. if someone's paying me for it, hey, they're gonna give me a check for it. Do we want? It's not it's not my it's not like a representation of my specific photography. You know, it's right. like, it's just a photo. That's cool. Yeah, I don't I don't really care. Yeah. It's when it's my own thing or like, you know, I know say for instance when I'm something's going to get get used in say like dig i know the layout's going to be the best they possibly can i mm-hmm. have something like that happening and then i do my own stuff too like maintain stuff it's like yeah it's i let the photos speak for themselves oh yeah and when you came up with maintain did you already i i overheard in the in the rollback pod that you had uh the sequels kind of planned out is that right yeah so you already had like an idea like 
of how uh, many you I, wanted to I do? I have like a, a rough, like basically the general idea is whether I stick to it or not. I can't say for sure, but I'm uh. trying to. It, there's going to be a total of 10 chapters, but there's also these like half chapters in between that are like smaller smaller entities of a chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the first three were zines because like I had never done any kind of independent publishing before. It was always like someone else's right. like, publishing route. Mm-hmm. And I was just giving content for for that. Um, I did a zine. Like I said, I did a zine when I was a kid, but that was like, doesn't really count. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's photocopied, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so I, I didn't want to try and do anything substantial, like super extensive until like I had an idea of like what I'm doing. So, so yeah, the first three ended up being zines and then from then on, and then they turned into something a little more substantial, like, like more like a book. So that's what number four and five and and what how do you know when you've got a whole issue what how, what constitutes that you're like all right this is an installment um the first one was more i had a compilation of photos and each one has a theme mm-hmm. each chapter has has some kind of theme um the first one was definitely more along the line the theme was wasn't really based around the photos it was just more a bunch of random photos uh that i had compiled over the previous few years that weren't didn't get used anywhere Mm -hmm. um and then from then on like the second and third onwards were definitely the theme was more based around the photos themselves Mm, cool yeah so is there like a and there's a theme for like each one that i'm going to do oh okay so what so like i did number five was pavement or chapter five was pavement ethos and that was you know based around uh, street riding. Yes. Um, there's a theme for the n- number six, but that six won't be coming out for probably at least like a year or so. I got a, a big project that's a maintained project, but it's more, it's not like a, one of the main chapters because it's not just my photos. Uh, mm. It's based around Posh. Mm. So that's going to be like a book in itself. Wow. Um, Due to the extensive work, I was like, well, I'm going to make it part of the maintain series just because, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot going on with it. So, but it's coming along and should be out in about a year. Nice. Yeah. Is there a long turnaround from the time you submit the the zine to uh, it getting printed and handed back to you? It depends on the part, like the printer. Yeah. Sometimes it could be a week. Sometimes it could be a little longer. Holy shit. Um, they usually do it pretty fast. That's wild. Cause it's like a hardcover, man. That's like a real deal book. Yeah, yeah. That last one. Uh, I mean, the turnaround time of that was definitely a little longer, hmm. um, due to like where I got it printed and all that. But um, that's probably like closer to like a month. But um, yeah, the, the um, they you get once you get it finalized, then goes pretty fast. Nice. I I was really uh, pumped on the. Um, temporary permanent or is it permanent yeah temporarily permanent temporary yeah it's chapter four yeah oh man that's just such a cool concept so did with the maintain were you like i'm gonna do 10 and then i'll figure out which one each will be as i go or did you already have like had these subjects yeah, it's more like i have a, like a rough idea mm-hmm. of what i mean i there's still one or two that i don't have a definitive theme for yet mm-hmm. but they're then i'd say at least three I have 100%. I know what they're going to be themed around. Um, temporarily permanent was more like I had an idea that I was like kind of chipping away at. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't really know what it was going to be until after I did chapter three. Then I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this part of something. And then it just turned into being something. <laughs> Not yeah. just part of like part of it. It ended up being the, the theme. Yeah. Um, because I ended up being like, once I really dove into it and focused on getting the after photos, um, mm-hmm. then it turned into something where I was like, oh, wow, this could be fully substantial, like really something really substantial on its own. So, yeah. And are you are you juggling a, um, other stuff while you're going through this? Because I mean, it, the... oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all I mean, any of the maintain stuff is just like my free time is devoted to that. You know, it's right. not like, obviously I don't make any money on it. It's just, it, it pays for itself mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. helps pay for a trip or two. Awesome. But I don't, it's not, yeah, it's not like 
something that's uh an income sustaining project <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it, it, it it's a labor of love but then also it's like it still takes time even just this posh book is like yeah. i haven't even like scratched the surface on the text yet mm -hmm. which is going to be something I'm, you know that's the focus this winter is to like really get that all dialed in but like i already spent like I don't know, can't even imagine how many hours and it weren't even, there weren't even my photos, just, just collecting the photos, you know, it's like, it's, everything takes a lot of time, but <laughs> way more than it's financially worth. Mm -hmm. but, so you better be just doing it to like, cause you just want to put something cool, you know, that hopefully yeah. people think is cool you know, together, you know, like, or just yeah. a project that you just want to do. It's more of a hobby than, than anything, you know? Yeah. And, but at the same time, it's like, you don't want to forget about it. You don't want it to fall to the wayside and then it never happens. Yeah, right. Kind of like uh, this video I'm working on. <laughs> kind of what's happening to it, but it's finally like getting close to being done. That's like another part of the maintain series that is finally coming together. A little we had some delays. I had to change the name even of it just because of that reason. But it's um, almost there. Getting close to finally finishing it. So it's gonna be a maintain video. Yeah. So yeah. you were. Be, uh, I'm not really gonna say the name yet because it's not officially out yet. Mm -hmm are officially released like any specific date when it's coming out yet or and once i have a specific date then i'm gonna release a trailer and then that will have the name in it so Sick. but it's basically chapter 4.5 wow hmm. yeah. damn so now, that'll definitely be out before the polish book so gotcha i'm not gonna say exactly when yet because i don't want to jinx myself mm -hmm. <laughs> after it's already been supposed to be out I, in my mind i was like oh it's gonna be out like 2021 or whatever i mean COVID obviously was a big factor yeah why i got played but beyond that too it just just, just things happen and but it's getting there yeah yeah it's getting pretty happy with the uh what it's shaping up to and and this one is uh hd or is this gonna be uh hd yeah, yeah. yeah i only shoot hd now i don't i don't do the uh <laughs> sd tape stuff anymore that's mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the past. Once you can get past it, get past it, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> nothing against anybody who's into it, or whatever. I know, like, obviously, there's a huge, like, cult following of VXs and you know SDs with cameras and all that. But yeah. to me, I, I've been through that, and yeah. I just, it's just not. I'm kind of like I said, I'm, I'm more into the trying to make modern technology work for me as opposed to trying to battle. Yeah. Older technology, which I've always done with my cameras too. You know, film cameras, same thing. You know, it's like yeah. you you battle, you're battling older technology to make sure it's still working. Oh yeah, big <laughs> but, time. But I'm not going to do that in the video end. Mm -hmm. Photos, that's fine. But. Right, and you just turned fifty, right? Uh, fifty-one. Fifty-one. Nice. Well, happy belated. Thanks. You don't look like a year over thirty. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I I literally went riding today i had a little bit of free time i'm like i could do a workout i've been trying to do the knees over toes guy like walking backwards thing mm -hmm. and i don't know what's wrong with my knees but i got issues and um literally because i heard on the rollback pod you were talking about how you just ride all the time and you're Drive good it. yeah <laughs> do you have things that like jump up in front of it nowadays is it getting harder i mean always the older you get the more responsibilities usually mm-hmm you know, increase also. Yeah. And which then in turn shrink, keeps shrinking your riding time more and more and more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now it's more like, I mean, I have my days, but especially when I'm on, if I'm on a trip or something, then I have like a lot more free time to like just devote to riding. But I, I just, if I try to get in, like, you know, fortunately where I live, there's a number of amazing places to ride. Mm -hmm. So I can get away, even if it's a half hour, an hour, I can do it. And it's not like, impeding on my other mm -hmm. obligations i need to do that day right so i try to get it in yeah yeah and and regularly as possible it seems like i i had like a weird epiphany after i heard that because i was like i can sit here and and do push-ups and stare at the wall or i could go pedal and like i'm gonna be doing squats every time i bunny hop you know like yeah. you're you might like if if you can like doing like a nice light session like just a couple one A's, a couple bunnies, you yeah. know, get your heart racing, scare yourself a tiny bit, you know, yeah. it's like, damn. All right. Um, so are you shooting full-time BMX or is there um, other ways you're making yeah, ends meet? I, I, I haven't shot full-time 
BMX since 2014. It's mm-hmm. just, I, everyone wants to dig, dig, uh, deal ended. Mm-hmm. And then came once there was like a, you know, pause and then a dig started coming back again as, you know, a website primarily. Yeah. Um, then it was like part time from that point on. Um, so I just do, you know, I just have all kinds of random odd jobs, whatever going on, photography, non photography related, just whatever pays the bills. Damn. Just making it work. That's cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, going back to like we were talking about rotting and all that too. Like mm-hmm. one thing I like I always like to mention is I feel like at this point in time I'm sure everybody has their own different perspective on it, but for me personally, for me to feel comfortable on my bike at all times and like which then makes you more confident when you're riding. Yeah. It's like riding is is much like even if I said even if it's like 15 minutes a half hour doing that multiple times a week or, you know, as much as you can consistently is like the most important thing for me, like mm-hmm. to feel good on my bike. So it's not, it's not the quantity of time. It's like, it's like the, it's the, uh, just the consistency of it. You know, mm. if it's only like a little bit, just to keep that feel of comf- like being comfortable on your bike. Preach. Important. And I Absolutely. feel like that that's become more and more important the older I got, I get, mm-hmm. especially. And I'm I'm finally realizing that myself. <laughs> I just turned 37. I'm like, fuck, man. <laughs> uh, it, it's so crazy because I, I feel like like I looked up to so many people who really weren't that much older than me. And mm-hmm. I, I put them on this weird pedestal and I put myself in this weird like bottom, bottom feeder level. And I'm like, one day I'll learn that, you know. And then yeah. you, you kind of like push it off. You never really learn it. And then you're like, huh but it's all good. Yeah. 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 I mean, tricks are tricks, whatever, you know, it's like more, I mean, I don't know. Everybody, everybody has their own um, perspective on like what is enjoyable about riding. But for me, it's never really been about like how many tricks I can do, you know, it's more the actual enjoyment of riding. Yeah. And you've always, there's there's certain perspectives of like, what's a trick, you know, like Mm -hmm. a bar spin is a trick. This one person to me, you know, learning how to ride a, a couple features within a park to get linking them together without pedaling is another way, you know, yes. like that's to be able to pull that off is to me is a trick. So mm-hmm. I always look at them as completions. Like you're going to yeah. come up with something in your head and you're just going to try and get it, get it going. Like, like you said, if it's to do get from here to there without pedaling uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, the little devil bowl. Yeah. So, uh, drop in, hit the spine, hit the vert wall, and come back, hit the spine, and come back out. That's it. But yeah. to do that breakless for me yeah. was the hardest thing. And when every time I am able to do that, I'm like achievement. Like it's yeah. a little completion, you know. Like that's that's a trick, you know. <laughs> to for, me, you know. Like. <laughs> yeah, for real. It's crazy. And and, uh, and it's like a level of like personal accomplishment too. It's not so you could do certain things. Like when you unlock. Yeah, a new level of, of doing something, you know, it's like that. That's a new trick. It's like, oh, I learned, you know, actually learn a new, like a physically a new trick. But it's it is a new trick, and yeah. on a different, you know, from a different perspective. I was just laughing to myself because I was thinking, finally, I can ride the bowl counterclockwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, once you could turn around and come back. That. A trick to, to some people, you know. Yeah, and and I, yeah, definitely, and um. Is there any kind of like tricks that are that, well, like, I feel like I'm not, I'm not good. Like I'm definitely like mid at best, but I got caught up in the progression of riding. Yeah. Where like I try, like I learned bar spins. I eventually learned them. And then, you know, I tried to do it off a curb. I did it down a two set and it fucking sucked. My, it like hurt my hips. I like landed like my with my knees locked and it just like it sucks so bad i'm like i i don't think i got it in me (laughs) you know yeah and i feel like i got caught up in in the progression thing where i like i i felt progression happen i got kind of like psyched on it thinking i could get more out of it and then i kind of realized let's back off and just kind of do what comes easy and Mm -hmm. for me pushing myself now is like jumping a hip you know like a you I know mean, like a quarter to quarter hip you know yeah yeah i mean like i said that's 
it <laughs> also comes down to personal perspective on what yeah. progression is. You know, it's like I, don't, I, have my, I have my personal way of how I look at it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes so-called progression is just maintaining what you're doing. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, that's, and the older you get, the more important that becomes. You know? mm -hmm. so not necessarily like learning an actual new trick or whatever. But for me, my my perspective of progression is more might be doing something over over something but like something i already know it's not like i'm trying to necessarily learn something new yeah but i'm learning something new in a different way not right. a new trick but like a new way of writing some, uh, something that might have written for years mm -hmm. definitely so, like in that new that that edit that i put out there's a line that i do at fdr that i've been writing fdr consistently for over 15 years now ever since i lived in philly that line has always been there i just never saw it yeah no i never saw anyone do it and i never like looked at it as a way to do it but it works and was it's this like lines now now to me that was like progression for me i was like oh i learned something new here and you that know? was uh i'm going off memory that was with the titties was yeah that... it's like you drop in like that um there's like that like steep corn uh back bowl yeah so you drop in there and then you kind of hit this like i call it like the slattery hip because like he was the one first yeah. one i saw hit but not from the way i went yeah. And then you can then you hit this other hip back over. Um well it's not really a hip, but it's like it, you can use it as like like mm -hmm. a hip. But uh yeah, but that whole line was like the first part of it I'd never seen never thought about doing before until like a year ago. I literally thought to myself as I was watching, I was like, I think that's an NBD at FDR. Like, holy shit. <laughs> you know? Like I mean, it's kind of crazy because like when you think about BMX photographers and BMX videographers, it's like it's the the that dude shreds isn't normally like the first thing I feel like people say. Like I'm not trying to talk shit on anybody. I'm just saying like most of the time there are people that are behind a camera kind of stay behind the camera. Yeah. But like But it's it's pretty interesting though in like in in bike riding though. There there are like a vast majority of people who were photographers or currently are amazing riders. Mm -hmm. it's like like someone like Chris Hallman is like one of the most underrated riders ever. And he's an incredible photographer, someone who was a huge inspiration to me too mm -hmm. when I first started shooting photos, especially like seeing how he his foot his like photos were like always stood out. Mm -hmm. um, and he's always, always had an amazing eye. Even just looking at like because I was talking about the, the Posh book before. Yeah. Chris submitted so many photos for that, like in the early years of Posh, and there's just so many incredible photos that he shot. It's like, yeah, just really cool. But yeah, so back to saying, yeah, like he's an amazing rider, you know, like there's so many people like Keith Mulligan, yeah, uh, Tara, like, uh, man, yeah. Sandy Carson, obviously, like, there's yeah. just, yeah, there's so many people that are like, you could tell that it's like, you know, they're riders that became, you know, like, mm -hmm. photographers an extension of their riding you know yeah. like, which is the case for a lot of people you know yeah and um, i like i mean i mean it, you don't have to be good and, and it's also don't get me wrong it doesn't mean that this mean that you have to be a ride like yeah a rider first and a photographer there's plenty of people that are amazing photographers that don't really ride or whatever too you know it's like uh, but it's it, but it's just interesting that mm -hmm. there's like the, the percentage of of photographers over the years who are like also like amazing riders is like it's pretty pretty high yeah, and 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 I like seeing, I like seeing the people who are behind the scenes, like uh, the I think it was the doorstep video. Yeah, like yeah. I think Jeff Z had a part in, it and yeah. it was, I was like, I fucking love this. Like I like seeing. He is. He's, he's no, he's like he's always been an awesome rider. Like it's just because yeah. like any I feel like anybody who's involved in BMX, like I want to, I would love to see a section of them. You know, like yeah, I don't like it when there's somebody who like is involved, but like you never see clips of him. Like I would love to see a Stu Johnson part, you know, like doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's new or Stu's old. Still riding. He's like, yeah, yeah. You might not see, see it him it documented, but he's still out there. Yeah. So I see him shredding a bit, but, uh, you fucking kill it, man. That, that, that clip at FDR was really sick. Oh, um, thanks. Appreciate it. And, uh, when, uh, how did you come up with the song choice? Oh, <laughs> that's like, so when I was like, I don't know, I don't even know when the song came out sometime mm -hmm. in like mid eighties, I think. So I was probably like 12 or something. Like I liked the song when it first came out. Yeah. And then 
a couple of years later, I'm like, yeah, it's just kind of corny. Like I'm not really, <laughs> I wasn't really, didn't really like it anymore. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know, a few years ago, I like kind of heard it again and it was kind of like, yeah, it, it just kind of made sense to use. So lyrically and musically, okay, I liked it. So I don't know how many other people like the song, but it just, I figured works for that. Well, uh, I saw in, I saw somewhere in the archives, you were talking about the song for don't quit your day job too. Yeah. Which was like the Eurythmics. And it was like, yeah. I remember when that came on, I was and like, and that's another song. Oh. That song probably came out around the same time. It's like yeah. they're within like a couple of years. Like, yeah, it, it was like 85, 86 ish somewhere. I'd say mid eighties. They were, they're both, I couldn't pinpoint the exact years. I'd have to like look it up, look up but, the music version of 23 mag. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause that's the kind of stuff that gets me jazzed up about bike riding is like a good, like a good song that matches the, the footage it's edited well, like that gets you so motivated to ride. Like, oh yeah, for sure. I, I mean, so many. You, it was such a cool you thing. Look to at the Mikey Aiken part in Anthem too. That's like one of the all time, yeah, best parts. Like, that whole video and mm-hmm. and obviously riding wise, like mm-hmm. so obviously Stu's a genius at that. So, yeah, it, always shows in every all his projects. When when the the cleared music wave started happening, I got so bummed out. Like. Yeah. To the point where I almost wanted to like re-edit other people's footage and do like a mashup and like just throw a new song on, but I knew I wouldn't be able to get the bike sounds out. So I was like, ah, I don't know, because then that's that's just as bad because you don't have the bike sounds, you know. Like, yeah. When the when the video is, sometimes people uh, put the music to the video and then for some reason like there's like no audio of the bike grinding or anything at all. Yeah, you know? it's definitely a big part of. Yeah. Like the appeal of of a bike riding video is is the actual sounds of riding you got to hear at least a little Which bit is funny too because like the um <laughs> that fdr clip you're talking about before has like really no audio just because fdr is so hard to yeah. like good audio from it's yeah. like yeah it's kind of and that wasn't like if i was filming someone else it would have been a little different but um i would have made it work but since mm-hmm. it was just me riding on it i don't really care too mm-hmm. much but a biscuit had to like yeah, there's almost no audio. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, yeah, FDR is definitely like one of the trickiest you know, places. Most of the other, most of the other clips in that, in that, I was able to have like decent audio. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you about your bike setup. I don't think I've ever seen your bike setup switch. It's always been two pegs and brakes. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I was just lo- going through some photos earlier, and there was a photo of my bike from like I don't know '99. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's really not much different. <laughs> I think that at that point I was still riding. Uh, I think I had S and M ditch forks. They had like the peg bosses on it. Yeah, I was, yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't ride that. <laughs> again, but outside of that, I mean, maybe the bar height might be a little different, but yeah. everything else is pretty similar. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I just like it, classic style. So I had the Hoffman Super Forks a little bit from compared to what I used to ride, but that's not not much. Yeah. Head tube's a little steeper, rear end's a little bit shorter. Not like, you know, nothing like 12 and 7, 5 or anything like that. No, but yeah. A little shorter. How tall are you? Uh, 5'11". Right, right. Okay. And what size frame did you, do you run? Uh, 21. 21, right. Huh. Jeez, I, ran, I remember running 27.5, I don't know, like early 2000s for a little bit. And then I, I think before that, I, I didn't really pay attention too much to – top tube mm-hmm. lengths i don't know if anyone did but <laughs> I remember like late 90s that became a thing at least at least by then um now at least that's when i started paying attention and then after that yeah i ran 20, 27.5 for a while and then went back to 21 and that's what i've ran for at least 15 or more years wow mm, that works i did, like it did you ever like throw on four pegs or rip your uh snap a brake cable and just go brakeless for the day or anything like that yeah i mean i've, re- I've had stretches of riding brakeless here and there mm-hmm. um it was one point where i was like probably for a couple of years sometime around like 2006 ish i'd say i was even riding trails brakeless holy shit i don't do that i wouldn't do that now but i was messing with it a little bit mm-hmm. um but then um yeah, yeah it just kind of and, and it was fine it was good i mean it was it was interesting because I remember before I took breaks off, um, I wasn't very motivated to ride that much at, at one point mm-hmm. for a number of reasons. But taking my breaks off and like going back to the basics, where like 
doing a manual felt like an accomplishment. Yeah. Like completely refreshed bike riding for me, mm -hmm. which was interesting. I mean, weird to think, but that's, that's what it took. And from that point, that's, and it like re-motivated me by a lot. Right. Um, I never like stopped riding or anything like that, but it was like there, I remember there was a period of time. It's probably just because that was when, um, bike riding became, or being within bike riding was my, became my full time job mm -hmm. through photography and, and I think the little video at that time still. Um, and it was before I really could like have that balance of like separating the two mm -hmm. where it's like when I'm doing photography or video, or whatever, that's one thing. And when I'm riding, that's another. Sometimes when it's like, you don't separate the two, it's all together and it's easily, it's easy to like get burnt out on bike riding and just wow, kind of yeah. like not motivated to ride. Mm -hmm. So that kind of started happening to me for a little bit, for a couple of years. Um, but, but yeah, then I don't remember exactly. I think it was, it was on some trip. I think I, I don't remember who I was with exactly, but I just remember taking them off and then trying to manual. And it was like, learn, I never learned how to manual properly. Mm -hmm. Like, which, you know, without using, without fingering or sorry, <laughs> feathering your brakes. Yeah. Your finger. Yeah. Um, so that just learning how to manual properly was like a new thing for me. So, oh yeah. And, and, and that, holding yeah. on to your so. grips without that extra. Yeah. I, I actually, yeah. I used to always, you know, never rode with a finger, not on the lever. Yeah. Um, but then now it's like, I almost prefer to ride white knuckle. It's like better. Mm. Even trail sometimes if I'm riding, like trails is the one thing where I like, I pretty much my rule of thumb is I'm always going to have brakes on my bike. Um, yeah. But there's times where I'm like riding a line after I hit it a few times, like I ride a white knuckle, you know, it's like, and that's um, with your, with no finger on the lever. Is that what that means? Yeah. Just, finger on the lever. just like used to be like, I would never do, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that was just like, that was like my e-brake and I needed that safety at all times. But right. yeah, things have changed and not always that way, especially around like a place like even like FDR or whatever, like I could ride there easily if it's a place I know well. I can ride there without brakes, no problem. It's just, I, I just, at this point in my life, when I go to anywhere new, like, especially new, you know, new skate parks, mm -hmm. I'd like to have brakes on just as have that safety factor. Yeah, especially if there's Not other people around. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, yeah, for sure. I, uh, I had, a the fir my first aftermarket seat was a snafu fat seat, whatever it was. And, uh -huh. The day I got it, I was manually with my bike and I looped out. And this was back when we had taller seat posts. Yeah. And I completely nuked the seat on the first day. Like it just, the cover ripped up, the foam ripped off. I was like, I damn near teared up. I was so bummed. Um, <laughs> and that was when I was like, I need to learn how to, f I had brakes on my bike and I was like, I need to learn how to yeah. feather brakes so I don't ruin another seat. And then, so like I eventually figured it out and then it came to starting to ride trails and I was like scared to, to do anything. Cause like, how, how do you like, I was watching my buddies, like the older kids, the better kids, like stop before the next lip. I'm like, Oh, okay. Like mm -hmm. you kind of, you have your finger on your lever there. Like it, it became like this tool that like opened up other things. It was like, yeah, I was like, all right, cool. I got a little bit of confidence, started jumping bigger jumps. The same year I started jumping bigger jumps, the trails got plowed. Uh, like, like literally. Trails for those. They were they were called the VA trails. Um, they were okay. near Minersville. Some of the Minersville people uh, had come through. I it was never there when they um, when they were around, but uh, they were big jumps. They they were um, big and, and steep. But not as big as Myersville, mm -hmm. so I guess some people will go to Myersville, get shook, and then come down to ours. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Myers, Myersville was no joke, man. I was like, the place was awesome. I never got Definitely to go. The, yeah, it was one of the best spots of that time period. That's crazy. I I, I wish I could have uh, seen it. I don't even like other than videos. I don't know if I've ever seen like a photo of it. There's been a few photos. Like I remember shooting a photo of chase hawk uh oh, maybe old right, man that was used, I can tell you what, what magazine but i think it was like he had, he had i remember it's funny because he had like 
two or three interviews come out in the same year. Like wow. Ride UK, Dig, mm-hmm. US, I think. And that photo was in one of those. But there's been a few. There was a, this local dude, um, Craig Kleckner. He had a cover of Dig, actually. Wow. Um, sometimes, like, I don't know. I couldn't tell you what issue, but it was like some, like Earl, like 2004 ish, somewhere around there. I, uh, that name sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, there's been a few photos over the years from Marnesville, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a really, really good, good spot. Did you ever get shout to ride to a Sean shout out to who? Oh, Sean Schoner. He was like one of the main locals there. Like, oh, he's shit. dude that like was like kind of the foreman of the trails. Gotcha. If I remember correctly. So yeah, he was wow. the man. Nice. Hell yeah. Uh, another spot that was near us is a uh, voodoo skate park. It was in Harrisburg. Did you ever get to ride that? I never, uh, I don't think I ever went to that park. I, unless, I remember going. Well, wait. There's a chance I went to it on like a mega tour. I think it was like mega tour two. They mega stopped there. Two. Yeah. All right. So then, yeah, I did. Go. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if it was called vo- that called voodoo or not, but I remember there was a park in Harrisburg. Yeah, with the climbing gym. It was so random at the time, but I think they were just like uh, 20 years ahead of the <laughs> ahead of the the game. There was man. like there was like these little like this inverted wall set up and there was like these climbing things and the guy was like uh-huh. the owner was dead set on having both like a, we're gonna have vert ramps and a climbing wall and it didn't yeah. make any sense at the time but looking back i bet they would rake in so much money just having an, an, a second reason for other people to come to your facility yeah, yeah. Or, hey if it keeps keep it pays the bills and keeps the place open why not you know I I have this brain fart. Not, not I, easy. The indoor park business is not easy. No, no. It's amazing when you place that's more than like ten years, just like, or let's just say even like five years. Yeah. Anyone owning a skate park is definitely doing the Lord's work, and I've I have this yeah, idea. Sure. Uh, maybe I could spitball it off or bounce it off you. Um, I'm not gonna do it, but just I wanted to put it out there as like, like a bike shop, like a hybrid bike shop where, uh. Maybe it's a coffee shop and a bike shop or an ice cream shop and a bike shop. Like another reason to bring people by, like, a, yeah. you know, like anything really. You could do whatever. A, ha- a salon, like a barber shop and a bike shop. You get your bike dialed in and you get your, you know, get the fade, whatever. It's, it's like possible. Cause I go to places like I went to the barbershop here in Albany and I'm like, what would it take for these guys to have like a wall full of parts? Nothing. You know, you got to have a mechanic, you you know, you know, got to cross reference one of these guys that can lace a wheel or some shit, but it's just ideas. Just thinking of like what more BMX could do. Like how can we, how can we save bike shops? You know, what, what else is there? Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to, like, a healthy scene that's around the shop, mm-hmm. you know? It doesn't matter how good of a shop you have. If you don't have a scene to back it up, it's it's going to be tough. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and uh, I wanted to ask you about tricks. Like, you know, uh, was there anything as you – I mean, you, you seem really dialed. Like, obviously, you don't do, like, you know, backflip turndowns, but you're really good. And I wanted to know if, uh-huh. if if there was anything that came like if there was anything that you ever tried that just was like impossible, like didn't it didn't jive with you, or if there was some stuff that came easy. Um, I don't know. I mean, like as far as I remember trying no foot cans when I was like fifteen, and they weren't. I don't know. It was kind of like a new trick, mm-hmm. and I didn't really know how to. Like I didn't have a a good guide on how to learn them. Mm-hmm. I remember trying them a few times, but not really doing them, and then I just kind of moved on from that. I, I, mean, I think I might have tried them a little bit a couple times after that, like a couple years later, and like might have done them a little bit, but I never like learned them, learned them, you know? Right. I never did like a Van Homan no foot can. Yeah. <laughs> a Van um, can. <laughs> yeah. I, as far as tricks coming easy, I, don't, I think everything always would. Nothing. I would say nothing really came easy. It was just like it was always like a. A progressive thing over time and you get it better and better you started out racing right 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I started out even before racing. It was like riding some dirt jumps in my friend's backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, like then that's when freestyle became something. I remember like um, <clears throat> when the everyone who had a subscription of BMX Action Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, when Freestyle Magazine came out, they got a fr the first copy free. And this was before I was like starting to get magazines, but my friend had a subscription and he got the first um, issue of Freestyle. And, and I remember that was like such a huge thing where it was just like, that really like solidified like Freestyle as something. Mm. And, you know, I wrote, I wrote, you know, Freestyle then, at least in my world was like, it was flatland and there was like ramps in the magazines, but none of that existed where I lived. There was no skate parks. There was nothing. It was just like flatland. And then like I said, there was a couple, I won't even call them trail spots. There were just like places that had a couple jumps. <laughs> yeah. Like within like you know, a bike ride, you know, within a few miles from me. And that um, was Jersey. And then there was like, it was stuff to ride like around town, but street riding really wasn't anything yet it wasn't like it wasn't considered something it was just like you're hitting some curbs that was like now i look back at it now i'm like yeah street riding but like it wasn't called that it was just like you just you're just riding from point a to b driving to the convenience store you know? <laughs> right yeah. jolt cola and milky way you know it's like i don't know that's you know you yeah. weren't really i mean i remember i actively started figuring out like the good curb cuts around my neighborhood yeah. and that's like became yeah. You no, know, like you know, and there was like a bank under an overpass that I would hit on my way, but it was like, you know, you didn't know what to do with those things. I mean, my town, I, I the town I grew up in, there's there's some actual spots there now, but like you didn't know there were spots back when I was a kid. I didn't know that was a spot because like it was before pegs really like you use pegs to grind. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So it's kind of so I kind of like went off the uh the original question no no it oh, makes sense about, about tricks in general yeah i mean because uh, it, it seems like transition comes uh comes naturally oh, yeah, to sorry because you were saying about racing yeah, yeah, yeah sorry so i'll go back to yeah so so yeah when i first started riding it was like before i started racing i was just like I said riding yeah uh so, some jumps that were around town and then got into like freestyle which was like I said flatland there was no ramps um and then it was kind of like at that point a friend of mine raced and i knew there was a, a bmx track like you know in some like you know not too far away as far enough like you could, it was an hour pedal but you could do it mm -hmm. but um but uh so i got i just made the choice i'm like oh, i want to like I, got, I started racing a little bit and i just like i like that i like the, the idea of like pedaling like going fast hitting stuff and that's what appealed to me flatland didn't really appeal to me that much mm -hmm. so like i just kind of stopped doing that and i think if there were like a skate park or the only there was a, one time this dude had a ramp in his yard for a few months it was a half but i didn't know how to ride it mm. i rode it once or twice but i feel like if there were something like a, a real ramp that i could have ridden more or there was like a skate park or something i might have racing might not have been my path right but it ended up being my path because that's all that was right like that that appealed to me when it came to bmx mm -hmm. so that's the route i went which was like and dirt jumping before there were like really trails was like an extension of that so like, that's what i also liked nice i uh so yeah I, uh... so I raced for like a few for years and then after a certain point i got kind of over that and was just like that's the when i was just like I was riding other stuff too at that point again like I was that's when skate parks started appearing so like that were like not far away so started riding skate parks more and just like I said street riding was like becoming a thing at that point but like I kind of did it but it was not like something that I like fully gravitated toward yeah I got you there was a newer generation that did you know like mm -hmm. they're in my area which was like that was the don't quit your day job era mm. and it, it's crazy because it's like you were your interest in BMX was exactly when it went from this thing to like a bigger thing. Like you got to watch it blow up. Like, Oh yeah. And I got to jump. watch it collapse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the late eighties into the early nineties, it went from like this huge thing where like a good example 
of how big it was, at least in my world, was like when I started riding, there were like 20 kids in my grade in my middle school that rode. Mm -hmm. And then there was like another like 10 or 15 people that wrote kids that rode that were like older than me so there's like this huge amount of people just in my town that rode bikes it was crazy like wow. thinking back like how many people rode I, I rode with for the first year i rode like actually got a bike and rode and then within span once we entered high school almost everybody stopped riding <laughs> <laughs> like one dude that like this dude Craig who got really good at ride like riding and he ended up getting like sponsored and like starting to go to contests and stuff. But outside of him, everyone else stopped. Wow. And then it and then by like within a few years later than that, that's when like the whole BMX industry as a whole just like collapsed and there was like no one that rode. I knew everyone at that point I knew everyone who rode within like a thirty like tw- I would say thirty maybe like ten or twenty mile radius and it was like five people. You know, it's wow. like but when there was like I said over, over 30 people just in my town that rode before. And so, um, wow. yeah, it was interesting seeing like the, the cycles and, you know, cha- how drastically things can change and go from, like I said, like hundreds of kids within your, you know, 10 mile radius of riding to like, like you said, like two people. Yeah. So tell me more about that collapse. What did, what happened? Did the bike companies just go out of business or, um, it was a mix of media, bike companies. It was just like, it was like BMX became like a fad essentially, like the whole mm. freestyle thing like blew up. But I mean, I was I was younger at that point, so like it's not like I had any kind of like inside industry info. Right. I'm looking at it from like a young kid out, like an outsider who was a young kid. So I don't, I couldn't say. I mean, I've read tons of interviews of random people over the years that like were. On, we're like so-called insiders, mm-hmm. but from what I gather, it's more like BMX was had this like perceived image, and it was very like kooky and kind of gimmicky and corny, and that's what was really pushed by all the bike companies, and the, and by default the magazines because they were the companies were paying for their ads and that mm-hmm. you know. And if you look at editorial back then, it was like there wasn't much editorial. It was more, more ad related than anything. Mm. Um, so that's what BMX looked like, and that's what if you didn't really see past that, it did became become a fad to a lot of people. Wow. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. Like I, yeah. I just found deeper meaning in bike riding than what I saw in magazines. Yeah. Um, I could say like I knew what what it was. I couldn't pinpoint it, but I just knew there was more to it than what I saw That's so being crazy. presented to me. It's so um, wild. And then, you know, by, I'd say by like the late 80s into the early 90s, there was a number of people who were in the media end of it, especially like the the Go era of um, magazines. The people that were running Go, like they were putting out a lot of like more – mature outlook on bike riding um but it was like a little too late you know it was like for for the masses masses you know as far as like absorbing that so uh, that bike riding was already kind of like this free fall and then it bottomed out in like i guess like early 90s like 91 92 where there was just like just a couple bike companies there was like bmx plus was the only magazine it went from like i don't know there had to been like between freestyle and racing there was like six to six or more magazines just in the u.s that's not including like internationally wow uh to like one you know <sighs> and me and at that point too magazines were the only form of media yeah there were yeah. like videos kind of starting to come out but it was like magazines were like the the primary source there was no others there was no internet there was nothing it was that was it so like when you go from like these like there's a basically like if you're wow like you know compared to like internet where it's like mm-hmm. oh if you had these multiple bmx websites and they all just disappear and there's just like one left you're just like well, what happened you know it's kind of like what happened in the magazine Damn. end of it um so holy shit it's kind of like um you watch that video ride on it kind of like touches on that oh shit uh, a little I, bit i gotta write Intro. that down i never actually seen ride on ah uh, oh, man i fucked it's up a classic definitely mandatory viewing yeah 
seen a couple older videos, um, but that definitely yeah. that's one that's I need a, to a, bone up. Of all the older videos, that's like one of the most important ones. I would say anybody who is looking from a, for like see like a, a historical aspect of bike riding, that's like yeah, and it's sent some further reading, further yeah. viewing. <laughs> And did that come out around that same time frame? Ninety two. So it was like at the, the like I said, it came out right at the like the bottom of of the uh, that whole crash in bike so, riding. So when when the go stuff was coming out, it's that not one... like it's not like the <clears throat> that like it's just a popularity. It's not like the people that were into bike riding. There was people at that point. People were more into it then than they than they were. People were into it like people's reasons for being into bike riding were already established as far as like the longevity end of it mm -hmm. to keep people like, like, you know, like Wilgerson Hoffman, like those dudes like that. They, they, they saw past what, like the gimmicky stuff also and, and anything else. They, they saw something more to it and that's why they stuck around obviously. And, um, yeah, so sorry, go ahead. I kind of cut you off. I can't remember what I was going to say that, I'm just okay. putting together the the timeline in my head. That's so wild, though, because like yeah, I'd say like I said, it it, it started like it, its peak was like eighty six, eighty seven, probably in freestyle at least. Yeah. Um, I would say eighty five to eighty seven. Eighty eight was like leveled out, and it was like kind of like starting to I think kind of start creeping down. Eighty nine, ninety, ninety one was when it really just went like just dropped through the floor, and then by like yeah, I said by like. The last issue of Go was 92. Um, I think it was like March 92. And then from that point until 93, like for a year, there, there was, yeah, BMX Plus was the only magazine. And then after that, that's when Ride started. Ride US, Ride UK, and Dig all started, I believe, in 93. Wow. And then that was kind of like part of the, the rebirth of bike riding when it was like, you know, Hoffman had started doing his series. Wilkerson was still doing some stuff. Um, that that kind of like started like generating more people being involved in bike riding yeah and kind of so you know like standard at start like industry wise too you know like hoffman obviously had his had hoffman going there's like yeah you know stand started it's a bunch of other rider owned companies were kind of starting to pop up so it's almost like it was almost like a post freestyle movement in a way like if you think yeah, in, like mean, musical terms like, yeah because, like, the peak of that, there was really not, I mean, there were independently owned companies, but they were, like, not really, like, based on people who had really dove into riding mm -hmm. and were doing, trying to present riding in a, in a more mature, like, refined way. Um, that didn't really happen until, you know, the late 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris Molar, the s &M, was, like, one of the first to really, like, start that movement. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, and then after that, once, once the mid nineties hit, that's when like things really kind of kicked in Wow, and became much more like a established. So when I started riding in 99, I was, I had already, I was already catching that wave as it was, as it was already going up. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I still had around that, at that point, there was like, a new wave, there was like, 99 2000 also there was like this new wave of like rider owned companies getting yeah. established too so and that was like a second wave essentially right right okay now i'm seeing it i can i can picture that wow yeah like fbm started making frames volume started metal started yo um, everybody around here like nobody where in my hometown like no one rode bmx like there was a few people but like mm -hmm. when a normie, when there would be like random normie people who'd be like, oh, you know, Brock Yoder. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like I was, I got a job at a machine shop out of high school and I'm just working with this one dude and we're just like shooting the shit. Like, what do you do for fun? I'm like, oh, I ride BMX. He's like, I know this one dude who rides BMX named Brock Yoder. I'm like, what the? <laughs> Brock, Brock's a wild dude, man. He's like, so crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, sure, still is. But yeah, I haven't seen him in years, but yeah, yeah. Hope he's doing all right. Um, but back to the the uh, doing what feels right thing, and what comes easy. Mm -hmm. So, like 
for me, for me growing up and getting into riding, like grinding and that kind of stuff came easier, came quicker. Like it took me a while to figure out how to jump a spine. I've, I've never aired out more than three feet out of a quarter pipe. I've tried the one time I was actually feeling confident. I still couldn't get past fucking three feet. Uh, but now as I'm getting older, I look at like bunny hopping on a ledge and I'm like, fuck, I kind of like, like bunny hopping in general, kind of like, it doesn't suck, but it, it feels like it takes so much more energy. And then I'm like, I'm looking at this hip that you, you know, the hip still scares me. Like, it's like this steep quarter to quarter hip. And I'm like, it still scares me, but it's like, I'd rather kind of like try and push some progression over there instead of like, I know exactly what this feeble is going to feel like. I mean, I still grind, but you, you get what I'm saying? Like tr you're trying to search out for new experiences, but you're also like trying not to blow out your back, just getting your jollies yeah. out, you know, it's, it's just like, just, uh, it's, it comes easier. The harder stuff's coming easier in a weird way. But, it can, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, well, it kind of depends on the, what kind of stuff you consider hard. <laughs> yeah. Anything over coping is hard for me, dude. <laughs> yeah. I hear it. But, yeah. Aaron, Aaron, like Aaron a quarter has never been my strong suit just because I never learned. I didn't learn how to ride ramps until like I was older. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you learn, there's a certain age point where like, there's a point in eight, like where you, you get to a certain age where like if you learn fundamental things prior to that age, it's easy to be a lot more comfortable on it mm -hmm. doing that as the years go on and progress with it. After that point, it, it makes it's like a little bit a bit harder, you know, Yeah. like I did my first rail when I was like, I don't know, like late 20s. Mm -hmm. And it's like I've never been a rail guy. And that's part of the reason is because I never was like rails never became second nature to me right not that i ever did anything more than like double peg grind or whatever but like <laughs> i messed around with them a little bit but it just like at that point i messed around with them and then i'm kind of like it's I i'm more comfortable on it probably now than i would be back then but it's like it's not something i learned second nature like whereas like say something you know more fundamental like you know say like riding trails or something that's like always been something i've done since i was like started riding so it's like yeah. that is more of a second nature feeling to me right so and then there's certain just certain types of riding that's like i learned at a later age that i feel comfortable on it but it's like i'm never going to feel the same level of comfort that i did doing other things mm -hmm. you know? yeah I mean, other types of riding handrails are fucking one of those things handrails. where it's, you're kind of rolling the dice every time you know yeah i just feel like if you if you like i said if you started riding hand like doing rails at a young enough age it's the same as hitting a curb cut yeah know? yeah you're for always gonna be able to... for the right for the right prodigy it is for sure a risk involved <laughs> yeah <laughs> hitting, a, hitting a rail jumping on a rail as opposed to a curb cut but like yeah but like it's 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 that feeling of comfort and and like i said the second nature feeling of doing something is what's important yeah and, and you also then what you're you also gotta you i'm sure like this comes in comes into play is like knowing you're out like knowing how to bail like if you've been uh, riding yeah, trail since you're a kid you're, pro you're probably good at ditching the bike i was never i could never figure that out i could probably do that now if i wanted to because i but back in the day i was like throw my bike into the middle of the jump and, and baseball slide down the landing. No way. I just bought that thing. Like I would, you know, like your bike was so precious to you. Like the idea, even the idea of like throwing your bike like that was like foreign, but in real, in reality, getting away from the bikes, probably the safest bet you got. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it definitely is. Yeah. But, um, further away it is from you safer it is from you getting <laughs> ever since i saw that clip of ralph sinisi getting the bike the peg falling uh his bike he something happened and the bike was on the ramp and it fell off and the peg went right into his back i was like oh like that's like my worst fear um i did want to mention uh hackestown because i saw some clips of you riding in there mm -hmm. i got to ride there too before it uh yeah went went bye-byes but Damn, that mm -hmm. place was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because 
as a whole, it really was like kind of a substandard sort of shitty skate park. But due to it being relatively close, it was the closest indoor park for me and a number of people who grew up in like the northeastern New Jersey area. Yeah. And it became our local spot in the winter. Mm -hmm. And the ramps were kind of quirky and different yeah. compared to the average skate park in a good way. It turned out, you know, mm -hmm. like end up making it really, really fun. And yeah, there was an era that was like, like the don't quit your day job era for like that footage. It was from like, I'd say, cause I think at first it might've opened in maybe like 95, 96, but wow. it didn't allow bikes at first. Mm. And then I remember like late 96, they started allowing bikes, but there wasn't much ramp. There weren't many ramps there. It was like mm. not at anything special at all. Um, so the first like year or two that, that it wasn't it was okay it was just somewhere to ride but then the guy who who i don't know if he owned it or just worked for him but he started building more and more ramps and then he built some like like weird ramps like the, the everybody called like the battleship or the that, blob it was like the yeah. big big ramp it was like eight nine foot maybe with like a, a court like a five foot quarter extension yeah that thing was incredible it was like the coolest ramp ever mm -hmm. and it was just built by like some dude who was just experimenting he didn't know really know what he was building he just built wow. like a really awesome ramp that's so cool. um and that became like the same once that was built that like defined the park from mm -hmm. then on there was like all these other ramps that got built and so like i'd say from like 98 to like 2002 ish to three or four somewhere around there that was like the era where like yeah it was really really a cool time cool thing to experience yeah just from not even just a it, see that was the other thing too it wasn't just the skate park itself, which I really enjoyed because it was like more, it, there was nothing super intimidating that was built there. Mm -hmm. It was like this, even the spine was like this little, like four foot spine yeah. that was like almost too mellow, but it worked really good. It was fun. It was like, I learned spine tricks on it. Like mm -hmm. I, for that, I didn't really know. I didn't feel that comfortable rotting spines. Right. Um, so, but, but, it, but it's that beyond the actual ramps, it was the community behind it. Like yeah. that was show up there. Yeah, it was like our, our crew with those other dudes like you always had a lot of, it just it turned into this like really like tight-knit community that was like made winters really enjoyable mm -hmm. just because of all the sessions that we had i mean obviously hackett sound's not the only one that experienced this but right. this, this was the, the scene that i experienced and it was like the one indoor like park scene that i i like really had the most connection to Mm -hmm. out of any, any time point in my riding during the time I've ridden. So, um, it's like kind of a really special time period. Right. Um, for me personally, you know, so definitely. I... And then I remember, I think it was still around. I think Hackistown was still around. I mean, it was interesting because then like by like the mid two thousands, like the original scene kind of like, you know, went in separate ways or whatever. And there was like a new generation of riders and mm -hmm. there was a bunch of really good riders. And it was like, there was, they had that, like start doing those like late night. It was like 10 PM to 2 AM sessions where yeah. I went to a few of them, which was really cool. But it was interesting too. Cause it was like, there was almost, it was like packed and I, I enjoyed riding the place when it was like kind of empty. So right. it wasn't, it was like fun to see a bunch of people, but it wasn't that fun to ride. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer, I would have preferred to go like during the week when there was like 10 people there, yeah. which is funny. Cause that like set precedent for me with all parks today, like, no matter where I go, I try to go when it's empty. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather ride any day. I'd rather ride a place any day when it's empty than with a bunch of people. Yeah. Nothing against a bunch of people. It's just like, I just like having access to the whole place, the whole place. Totally. You know, so instead of having to dodge people or wait 10 minutes between mm -hmm. each time you drop in. So I remember um, the first time I'm I rode just... FDR that way. Like the first yeah. time I got to FDR, oh, FDR man, like, with no one around. Yeah. Yeah. Because when FDR, there's a, like, it, it's it's changed now where due to the incredible expansion of fdr yeah you can the main park can be busy and there's other areas to ride now where if it, if the park is busy there's parts to ride which aren't going to be busy yeah that i really enjoy that most people don't really like but i like them so it works out great <laughs> yeah um but uh yeah so i'm just kind of like yeah i've turned into like this borderline hermit where i'm like trying to <laughs> go to the park when there's no one there <laughs> oh man that's my favorite uh or any park i should say yeah um but anyway yeah sorry as far as the hackettstown thing goes yeah so like with hackettstown um i think by like mid-tooth i think it closed 
I moved to Philly like the end of 2006. I think it was still open then. And then I think within a year or so it closed. But there was a point where the ramps were always fun, but then they resurfaced them with this like gray state light stuff or whatever and like created the way the ramps blended to the ground. It mm. changed and it made this like harsh kink. And I remember going there for the first time in a while and riding it. And it felt like it, it was the same ramps that had been for a few years, but with that new layer of or that resurfaced layer, it just didn't ride the same. And I was just like not into the place at all. It's kind of like it's over. Like, wow. yeah, I'm like <laughs> didn't really care about going back in and yeah. Damn. And then, yeah, within like a year, it closed anyway. So, but but it was you know it was Crazy. it was interesting too because it kind of like created this like definitive like end of an era in my mind because mm-hmm. I wrote it and it just didn't feel the same. And not to mention like you know like I said the community had changed whatever not not a bad way just a different it was just different it wasn't you know things change yeah so, I, and it was cool to see a new generation of riders but um but the park itself I didn't like anymore so mm-hmm. I uh, and then that was it. FDR became my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't, so like I, I learned all my basics at Voodoo in Harrisburg, but I was too young yeah. to go there on my own accord. I, it was driving distance for me. So I mm-hmm. wasn't super involved or like into the scene there. I didn't get to like know that many people there. But then when I got a car, I just started going to fucking a different skate park every weekend. Like, East Coast Terminal, yeah. Tom's River, and then um, East Coast Terminal. That place, yo, that place was so fun. Ever, it was yeah, just like, yeah. Just because it was so big, it was like spaced out. Like all the ramps were, like, you know, a lot of the ramps were unique and different. Like mm-hmm. it, it wasn't at first glance. It wasn't like like Chenga was like an amazing park too, um, for for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Just because like the way everything worked so well together, I feel like. Um, East Coast Terminal was almost like a concrete park where you had to figure out how to ride it. Yeah. And I kind of like that. that was, the challenge was like learning how to link things together for me personally. And just like I said, all the ramps there were like really cool. It was just a cool place. Like just totally. You know, just always like a, yeah, one of those like real deal, like, you know, DIY style kind of parks, you know, like independent. Like it was just cool. It was just like, yeah, that was a cool era. Yeah. Especially when FDM, I mean, when, I'm sorry, when, uh, FBM was underneath, you know, in the basement for a time for a time period. It was like, yeah, that was really cool. I got the tour once. That shit was sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh man. Um, so, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Greystoke stuff a little bit. So your video part uh, got released along with the magazine, like uh, at the same time. Is yeah, it, it was kind of. Oh, sorry. What was that? No, go ahead. I think you were. You knew what I was getting at. Um, Okay. Yeah, it was kind of like I, I had the that part, that like little video kind of coming together and it was like pretty much done and it was just like, ah, I was like, you know, I'll probably just release it on the the uh, Dig YouTube because basically a lot of that footage was compiled while I was filming for this upcam- upcoming maintain video. So and that stuff was like your leftovers? No, 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 not uh-huh. of, it was footage of me but like i was filming other people mm-hmm. for this video mm-hmm. so i at, at a certain point once i was like the video was starting to like develop into something i was like ah, i'm not really going to use footage of myself all over this video like it was just there was like a good amount and i'm just like so i was like oh maybe i'll just put something together and just throw it online or whatever you know like just mm-hmm. something be why not you know mm-hmm. um so by the time that materialized, um, Gray Stoke was about to get released, and then um, Will asked me about like, "Hey, you want to like do something, make it kind of coincide with the Gray Stoke release?" So I was like, "Yeah, sure." I mean, I'm an old dude <laughs> <laughs> riding some shit, so I was like, "Why not?" Is the magazine kind of geared toward older riders, so kind of made sense. So yeah. Did you have photos? Uh, I I got it here, but I have I've been too busy to actually get into it. Um, did you have photos in, in the magazine as well? Like, uh, that you yeah, took or anything? Doyle. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, uh, at posh actually that, uh, was, I was hyped to see that it's like a full page yeah. in there. So, so what was the, I guess I can ask Scott about this more, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's mainly, mainly, you know, it's Scott and Will's 
baby and they made it made it come together i i helped out a little bit here and there but it's like mm-hmm. that's like the dude who made it happen i can't take credit in any way shape or form i'm like just kind of assisted a little bit that's mm-hmm. about it you know very very small amount but it's there they're the guys to that made it happen that's cool though because it, it's I, from what i've from what I've gathered from looking at it so far is like, it's definitely geared towards like the older people who are still around, who still love BMX. Um, I guess I'll, I'll have to ask them more about it, but it's just interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. Yeah. There, you know, BMX media has always, you know, always been focused on like, you know, the best dudes, whatever, you know, like yeah. you get, you get little bits and pieces of people of, you know, various interests that may not be pro riders or whatever which is cool too but as far as like primarily focused on a demographic that's growing a lot in bike riding Mm -hmm. that doesn't really exist whether it's like to the best of my knowledge like outside of like you know old school web bmx bike websites or whatever there's not really like anything beyond that Mm -hmm. so i think that's why this kind of made sense is to make something that's you know, something that people grew up on, like it's a medium that people grew up on, you know, magazines, like I was saying before, that was the primary source of BMX media mm-hmm. um, up until, you know, the mid nineties. By then that's when video really became a huge part of what people looked at. Yeah. Um, so if you grew up in, if you started riding in like pre like 1990, magazines were like that's what you look that's what you relate to as far as like a media platform so that's even makes it even better to make something like Greystoke that is for kind of geared not necessarily i mean any any age can any person of like any age range i'm sure can take something away from it because there's a lot of history in it yeah and if you're a nerd like the way i i always was when i was a kid i really enjoyed like doing research and like learning about the hi- history of bike riding. Even, you know, when I, st- I, I remember, you know, getting BMX action and then seeing there was like back issues available. So I'd start buying them just cause I mm. wanted to learn more about it. I was like w- one magazine a month wasn't enough of current events <laughs> wasn't enough. I wanted to learn, you know, learn my- more about the history of it. Cause I didn't, you know, I was new to it and I seen bit- bits and pieces. Sometimes magazines would touch on that, but you would never get like a, the only way you could really get a definitive, like grasp on on history is to like get the old issues mm-hmm. and you can really like really learn about it um so that's what i did when i was a kid right um but graystoke is now another platform for people both on a historical aspect and also like currently like showing showcasing riders who are older we're still into it just as much now as ever Right. So, That's really cool. Which is also, you know, something like DMC is like the, you know, prime example of that. Yeah. Dude's like mid fifties, you know, still killing it. <laughs> yeah. And still a hundred percent into it. Amazing. It's unbelievable. Really. It's, it's, it's awesome. Cause it yeah. gives somebody like me a little bit more faith in it because I've seen so many of these younger, younger dudes, like, you know, they're all up in the magazines, they're all up in the videos, and then out of nowhere, you don't hear their name, you don't see them anymore. It's like, what happened to that guy? You know, is yeah. I mean, it's that's part of life, and you yeah. know, yeah. people's interests change. You know, so you've, you know, so it's just yeah. Have you ever but, had any doubts or like any like times you ever thought about it, like thought about not riding and shit like that? Yeah. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm no, I mean, yeah, I mean, of course you're going to like, there's never a point. There's always going to be some points where you're just kind of like, well, yeah, what the hell am I doing? Like, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, if you're looking at normal society and then you look at the society that like is within bike riding, it's like sometimes it can be two separate things. And you're just like, yeah. there's the reality, you know, especially when it comes to like surviving, you know, paying your bills, whatever. You're just like, what are you dedicating your life to? Mm-hmm. and why so you you need to question yourself and i mean i question myself pretty pretty consistently you know which is for you know sometimes for better mostly for better sometimes for worse but like you, you it's always good to question yourself either way like i think yeah. you know, i think it's a bad thing yeah um but yeah i mean but usually it comes down to the point where i'm like what else would i be doing you know this is what i like doing this is what i've always liked doing so to not do it makes no sense to me so mm-hmm. yeah 
Yeah, and what else am I going to do? And and, and worst case scenario, I've, 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 I do other things, and I'm in, I have other interests beyond just bike riding. But bike riding has always been the fundamental, like like the foundation of like what I I you know it gives me the the a reason to go places for like tra- travels. Like I said, we were talking about travel before. Like yeah, that's like a, a big like a big passion of mine. I love going to new places mm-hmm. and it just gets the older I get. I feel like the more, the more intriguing it becomes a lot of times people like travel a bunch and then they're kind of like, Oh, I'm good. I've traveled. I'm done. I, and I wish I could be that way, but I'm not, I'm like, I, I want to go more places, you know, but yeah, so I try to. And, um, one reason for me to travel, one primary reason for destinations is my bike, you know, right. bike riding related, I should say. Yeah. So. It, it's a, that, gives, funny... that, that one gives me some has given me a reason to go to so many places. But I say ninety five percent of places I've been to is because of my bike. You know, like that that was the there was like an underlying reason related to my bike to why I went. Yeah. And it it keeps you active too, you know? Like Yeah. Like uh when I when we first got this house and I first moved in, I gained forty pounds. Like bad. Like I, I was I was on a bad trajectory and you know, I was like trying to do workouts and I, I wasn't feeling good like on my bike. So I wasn't riding, but then I went and I, I just got the sub rosa rail and just rode in the driveway a little bit. And I'm like, look at my watch. I'm like, I burnt more calories fucking around on a sub rosa rail than trying to pretend that I can fucking work out over here. I'm like, at the end of the day, like from the most um sterile version of it, I guess you could say is like, it's great exercise. Like you're keeping yourself moving. Like you're keeping yourself yeah, and, active. You're getting your yeah. heart rate up. Like, yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with like people who go to the gym, or whatever. They're, they're just trying to stay active and trying to stay healthy. Not more of that. But like for me personally, like I said, I don't think going to gym is a bad thing, but like, right. Fortunately, the way, what I like to ride and how I like to ride is a workout in itself. So yeah. maybe even what I was saying before about like, oh, if I get like 15 minutes or half hour, usually I have, I should say half hour. 15 minutes is probably like a little too little. Like that's not <laughs> enough time to feel right. good on my bike. If I have a ha- half hour to an hour, that like depending on where I'm at and what I'm doing, sometimes that is enough mm-hmm. for me to feel like, oh, good, I did something today, you know. And from a exercise slash health perspective, it's like, yeah, it's like it can be like an equivalent of like someone going to the gym for a little bit. So yeah. Yeah. It serves a lot of purposes, you know, <laughs> definitely does. And, uh, I, I'm thankful for BMX and I'm thankful that, uh, you've, you've had a, a say in BMX and you've, you know, left your mark in BMX and continue to, you know, like I think BMX as a whole is a better thing because of you, you know, um, I, is, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, is that, my my whole thing my motivation is just to like if i can make bike riding look cool in any way then you know i'm serving a purpose you know mm. and people like what i'm doing awesome you know that's all all i can do hell yeah i like and the that's, way that, that sounds completely rewarding and and 100 worth it mm-hmm. regardless of any negative things that happen which obviously every it's life things there's always gonna be ups and downs yeah and i Real quick, I just wanted to ask you, since you, you touched on it there for a second, what are some of your interests outside of BMX? Um, man, outside, well, they're somehow sometimes they're kind of related either way. Like, hmm. like I said, I've got really gotten into concrete work, like building, like there's this DIY spot near where I live that like I've been helping, like it's me and a few dudes or like the crew, the regular crew, and that's like oh, what yeah. we do. Like, yeah. we, build stuff yeah so that's been like a big like that's like a hobby for me now <laughs> as weird <laughs> as it sounds but doing that i really enjoy, enjoy building stuff when when i can to oh, the yeah. point where like if i hear there's like a concrete pour going on somewhere i'll try and go just to like one help two if there's dudes who do it for a living or like pro dudes or whatever it's always awesome being around dudes who who are that skilled at it mm-hmm. you always pick up something so it's like yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's like the other thing too with that, it, it, it's a hobby 
in the sense that like it's also contributing to a, to the community too by like us building stuff up at that spot it's not like i'm building it in my backyard mm-hmm. where like the only people who have access to it are the people that who i allow having mm-hmm. access to it it's open 24 7 to whoever wants to use it so right that alone is like really cool in itself just to be able to like contribute to the community in that in that way and it's not it goes beyond it's like it's probably the vast majority of people who do use it are skaters so <laughs> it's yeah. like the skate community. Yeah, that's cool i mean I've, I've taken advantage of so many places that the skate community built right so for me to give back in a way to the skate community is awesome too so i don't like yeah it's just cool to like be able to help to like contri- contribute back in a way too mm-hmm. even though i'm not like i skate a little bit but I, I wouldn't really call it skating i just like, kind of push around or whatever but so i do i utilize stuff skating wise too but it's all you know all the places ever in place like FDR obviously is like 99.9% built by skaters. That's like, yeah. that's one of my favorite places ever. And I've utilized that place to, to the maximum <laughs> that I can for the last 15 years. So, so like I said, for me to like somehow reciprocate it to the community in general is like really cool to be able to do. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So awesome. that's one thing. Nice. Um, I'm probably gonna sound like an old guy, but you know, like I love like as weird as it sounds, like gardening and shit is like I have a little yard. Yeah, that I'm able, I've been able to like it started scratch from it started from basically just like an empty lot, with, like a grass lot, to like now there's like fruit, the dozens of like like fruit bearing vegetation, which is like pretty awesome. Just to see that change and evolve to like where you're getting something in return, just yeah. for like facilitating like this whole pro- growth process yeah it, it's you're you're feeding yourself like it's self-sustaining like you're you're yeah, growing it you're yeah, taking care crazy. of it like yeah how much how much how much uh harvesting you can get from like just a couple of like bushes like mm. I, we have a couple uh, blackberry and raspberry bushes and it's like crazy how much we've gotten this this year alone especially is like nuts yeah like yeah we uh we yeah, used to really, garden but granted some things are successful some things aren't but <laughs> yeah but for the most the things that have been successful it's like crazy how well they they've done are you going straight to the ground a, what's that for the anything that's like uh like bushes or trees yeah mm-hmm. but our soil isn't the best because it like the neighborhood we we live in um there was a number of lead smelting plants oh. like 100 years ago wow. so the soil is definitely has a little bit high lead content so we don't plant anything that's like that you would be eating like leaves or, or like you know any any i i'm not really using the correct terms but we have raised beds that we plant most like uh, uh-huh. like say like tomato plants or pepper plants or like any kind of greens they, they we use raised beds for that and not directly in the soil for that reason because that because that will leach into the to the actual parts of the plant that you would be eating mm-hmm. um but if it's like a, a fruit tree or a set of the bushes um those i guess it somehow filters out mm. any of the impurities in the soil so like when you get the fruit that, that that's that's okay cool um yeah we we had a little garden so, area but uh before we moved but once we got here so we bought the house when there was snow on the ground and it was yeah. a sizable backyard and i'm immediately thinking pump track you know homemade pump track i'm i'm buying a piece of property i'm excited sand we literally have like black sand for soil oh, damn. so a i can't make a pump track and be like planting stuff is just like we got to do the raised beds like we started to build the beds this year but we got distracted and got into other stuff but i'm hoping to get into that pretty pretty dialed though like yeah that it works pretty good yeah um yeah awesome you got full control of what you know the soil so do you does that then lend itself into like more culinary like kind of like chef style stuff you starting to like now that you're growing stuff, you're thinking of dishes that you can utilize for that kind of thing? Um, I'm not much of a chef. I can make some stuff here and there. But mm. if I said I do it regularly, uh, my lady Nicole would fucking 
hit me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely does most of the cooking. So. Yeah. I right. can't take any credit in any way, shape, or form, but she's right. actually a really good cook. And yeah, she ends up taking the duties more from the not than so. That's what's yeah. up. But yeah, I, I think it's more just like, for me, it's not even so much about what you're making. It's just the, the challenge of like actually, of vegetation actually being like uh, successful in that it's producing something, mm-hmm. which is like, it's not an accomplishment itself for me personally. Like, oh, it's actually working, you know? It's like, actually it's not, I mean, it's just growing, you know, plants it's not really like rocket science but for it to work well i guess there is like little tricks that you got to do yeah. not to say i'm mr mr uh gardener or farmer or anything but um trying to trying to get my skills up yeah you gotta start somewhere that's for sure yeah. Yeah. but uh well i really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to shoot the shit uh is there anything that we didn't uh touch base on you wanted to shout outs or anything like uh, that Oh man, um, I think we kind of covered a good amount of stuff. Cool. Um, thanks to everyone who's spending their time listening to us <laughs> shoot the shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making it this far. <laughs> um, yeah. And thanks to everyone who supports the Maintain series. Uh, everyone who supports Dig. Um, Anything else I'm involved with? <laughs> right on. But, yeah. No, it's, it's really appreciated. Hell yeah, dude. And hopefully I can uh, keep producing things that people enjoy. Right on. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, thanks again, and I'll uh, I'll send you a link to this before it goes live so you can approve it. So we'll cut out anything, any of me flubbing around. <laughs> that was a lot there in the beginning. <laughs> Sorry it's, about that. There's a lot of flubbing around. Usually when I'm talking. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you have a good night, man. It was nice talking to you, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, sounds good. All right, man. All right, th- thanks for the interview. You're welcome, dude. Appreciate Cheers. It.